So welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon to Europe. Uh, good morning to US and Canada and good evening to Asia. We would like to welcome you to the second day of uh, the conference on asset management for occupational pensions. This is a conference run by the Institute of Finance and Financial Regulation. This uh, is an international research center which runs under the auspices of the University of Piraeus, in particular under the auspices of the Department of Banking and Financial Management, the oldest department in finance in Greece. So um, before moving on to uh, today's session, uh, let me thank our sponsors, our gold sponsor, Iolcus Investments, our standard sponsors, Piraeus Asset Management and Systemic, and our supporter, Alpha Trust. May I also thank our media partners, Economia Group, Euro Today, Naftaboriki, Next Deal, and the Savvy Investor. And um, if uh, you wish to find out more about our sponsors, you can visit the uh, digital booths. Uh, um, as I said yesterday, our sponsors are an integral part of our organization. We regard them as collaborators, as partners, and we wish to build long-term relationships with them. And given that the scope of the center is to bridge the gap between industry and academia, we are very much open to any suggestions you may have on collaboration. So without further delay, uh, let me move on to today's uh, session. Yesterday, we had a very lively session on the international evidence on occupational pensions. We talked about, Theodore Economou talked about what it takes for occupational pensions to continue being successful. David McCarthy talked about regulation of uh, defined uh, contribution schemes. And uh, Mr. Dimitri Zafiris from AOPA talked about the results of uh, stress testing. So today's session is going to be about strategies, asset classes, and ESG. And it is going to be chaired by Professor Gikas Hardouvelis, who will also introduce our distinguished speakers. Let me briefly say about Gikas Hardouvelis that he's a professor of finance and economics in the University of Piraeus. He's an IFFR fellow. He's a senior independent director of the National Bank of Greece. He has a very rich CV. He has served formerly as the minister of finance for the Greek government over the period 2014-2015. He has been chief economist in two leading Greek banks. He has been director of the prime minister's um, office. In fact, he has served two former prime ministers. He's a very distinguished academic. He has published in all top three and top five econ and finance journals. And without further delay, Gikas, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, George, for this uh, great introduction. I hope I'm not gonna let you down now <laughs> after all this. Uh, I just wanna say that the audience today, the uh, panel today is great. I mean, it, it composes of people who uh, span both academia and practice. And we have from all, all sides. Uh, we have three distinguished uh, panelists and I'm going to introduce them right before, uh, before the, each one speak, speaks. The, each one will have 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, first will be Nick Bautas. The second one will be Elise Gourier. And the third one will be uh, Joan Mur Murray. Uh, so I'll start uh, with, with Nick, Nick Bautas, uh, who uh, all of you, by the way, look, look young to me. He's a very young guy uh, who, uh, uh, you, who graduated from the Polytechnic uh, uh, Institute in Athens, and then he moved on uh, to London. I guess he got a PhD 
from Imperial. And uh, he sort of started as an academic. Uh, he started publishing. Uh, he was a lecturer uh, at, uh, for a while. Uh, but then I guess the industry absorbed him. He is doing uh, stuff that I guess academia cannot pay, pay as much. So he's trying to, but he's trying to combine both. And I, I admire that. Uh, he's now uh, also, he's right now, uh, he started at UBS, but now he's at Goldman Sachs, a managing director at a very young age. Uh, and he's the head of R&D of systematic trading strategies, an, an, an item we're gonna discuss uh, today. Uh, and he's also on the on sort of practitioner's academic side, he's the co-executive editor of the newly launched journal of systematic investing. So uh, without say saying more, uh, uh, I will uh, give the, the floor to Nick uh, to share with us his thoughts about strategies for occupational pensions, which is the item of our discussion today. Nick, please. You're muted, Nick, you're muted. You, you need to do it yourself, okay. Okay, there I am. I think you can hear me now. Uh, well, thanks, Professor. Thanks for this great introduction. I mean, echoing what you said like earlier on, uh, I'm hoping that I'm not gonna let you down now uh, <laughs> with all this great introduction. So, no, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks, uh, George and IFFR for kind of um, inviting me in this, in, this, in this panel today. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm hoping that you know what the world is kind of living through these days is gonna you know at some point is gonna get to an end because initially the plan was to do this live in Athens. So obviously uh, logging in from London, gray London, rainy London, I would have loved to be back home. Um, so I'm, I'm super happy to be in this panel because I realize that you have managed to bring together a number of practitioners, academics, um, some more quantitatively oriented people as well as more fundamentalists. So I think the nice mix you have in the audience would allow us to go, go in, in a number of directions. My field is specifically more quantitative in nature, uh, but at the same time, you know, we always have to find ways to explain difficult concepts in, 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 in layman's words, right? So what I'm gonna do today, and I had a long conversation with George as to how I should position uh, you know, those 20 minutes, is not just to give you a brief overview of what is going on globally in the institutional space. So in you know, a part of our of our job, of our mandate uh, at Goldman, is to speak to global pension funds, public and and and, um, and corporate, uh, sovereign wealth funds, institutions, endowments, foundations, as well as asset managers. Uh, so hopefully, with that exposure, um, we can let you know as to how the latest thought has been evolving, echoing as well what happened and what has been happening in the macroeconomy over the last year or two. And I think uh, Theodore yesterday gave a, you know, a great introduction to, to, to what I'm going to mention today. So if you allow me to share my screen, um, I'm going to pull it out. In, in our list. And now we're switching a little bit, not much. We're going from a person who is half academic, half practitioner, I'd say more practitioner, to someone who is, uh, who is an academic, is an assistant professor of finance at uh, ESSEC in the business school in Paris, is Elise uh, Aguirre. Uh, Elise um, uh, did her PhD in Switzerland in the uh, Swiss Finance Institute uh, back in 2013. Uh, she spent, she actually, uh, did something very smart, which is to go to the U.S. You have to be baptized to the U.S. to uh, really become uh, uh, top-notch. And uh, she was at Princeton uh, as a postdoctor, a postdoctor uh, research fellow, and, and then she joined Queen Mary University in London as a lecturer, and finally went back to France uh, to her country. Elise is um, uh, uh, is both uh, uh, a theoretical and empirical uh, finance person or economist. And uh, she has managed to actually uh, publish uh, already uh, in the top uh, finance journals, already two publications on issues that she will talk to us uh, uh, today. Uh, so um, especially Liz, uh, uh, lately she's interested in the private market and private market funds that we've heard about them yesterday and George mentioned them in the beginning. So uh, she has received many, I forgot to mention all the prizes. You guys, are all, you're all full of prizes. So we take it for, for, for granted, okay? Anyway, Elise, please uh, have the podium. We're, uh, we're happy to have you. And the, to the audience, please ask questions. I don't see on my 
screen any questions yet. So uh, please go ahead, Elise. Okay, thank you very much for the for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you also very much for the for the invitation. I would have loved to come to to Greece, but uh, unfortunately, it's going to be for for another time. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, more like a, a research agenda than than a particular paper. Um, so it's a research agenda that I've started working on a couple of years ago, together with uh, Will Getzman from Yale and uh, Ludovic Falipu from Oxford. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So I titled my presentation from public to private markets, risk and diversification. So that's actually a very broad topic. Uh, we started working on it, th uh, thinking we'd write one paper on it. Now we actually have three papers which were started plus two others together with Ludovic uh, and other co-authors. Um, so I'm not sure we're going to finish all these papers, but it's just to say there's a lot to, to, to work on in this area and it's a very exciting area to work on. All right, so what's the point of working on uh, private markets at all? Well, the point is that it's been developing tremendously uh, over the last decades. Um, so in terms of assets under management, uh, if you think about private markets as a whole, uh, so private equity, which includes leverage buyouts and venture capital, but also the new types of private markets. So here uh, that includes private debt uh, and real assets. Um, so basically just to give a very quick timeline, uh, um, well, LBOs, uh, leverage buyouts and venture capital have become like very popular in the 90s. Uh, and uh, then we had real estate uh, funds uh, starting around 95. Uh, in the early 2000s, we've had private debt, which, uh, which started. And around 2003, there's been uh, new types of, of real assets and that would include infrastructure and natural resources. So all these new asset classes have developed, have become very popular. In terms of asset man uh, under management, uh, they represent around $7 trillion. Uh, uh, so that's that's a recent estimate. So it's huge if you compare, for example, to the hedge fund industry. In terms of allocation, so Nick has been talking about uh, pension funds. Uh, on this graph, you have the evolution of the allocation of pension funds over time. So as you can see, in the 90s, pension funds were mostly investing in uh, developed markets, so equity and fixed income. Those are the solid lines, the blue and the red lines. If you look at the picture in the more recent years, uh, well, it's, it's been changing a lot. And in particular, you have this green line here, which has been increasing little by little. And this is the line that goes with private equity. So today, private equity represents about 20% of the assets of the portfolios of pension funds. And it's a trend that seems to be confirming in the, in the recent uh, years. So why can we expect private markets, private equity, or more generally speaking, private markets to continue developing the way they have? Well, simply because uh, not only do they become increasingly popular, for uh, institutional investors, but um, households uh, uh, more and more hear about these opportunities too. They make more and more noise in the newspapers. Uh, so very recently, um, US defined contribution um, plans have, have started, have allowed investors, uh, have opened the doors to, to private equity to investors. Uh, there's been reallocation of capital uh, in, in defined uh, benefit plans. Uh, so in order to have more emphasis on private equity. So this is something that's attracting more and more attention at the individual level, uh, as well as at the institutional investor level. So in line with this, there's been asset classes developing. Uh, so I've, I've talked about different asset classes, uh, which are predominant. Uh, um, Real assets in particular have been, uh, have been developing over the last 20 years. Uh, and here you have some quotes mentioning the reasons why they've been developing. So it's a bit strange in a way because real assets include uh, infrastructure and natural resources uh, as well as real estate. Uh, there were investments uh, in real estate in particular before the year 2000. Uh, however, these real estate um, investments 
were mostly carried out by uh, LBO funds. And just like now, a lot of infrastructure and natural resource uh, investments are shared by specific um, funds as well, uh, together with, with LBO funds. The, basically, the, the boundaries between the different asset classes have become very, very blurry. The reason why real assets are popular is that investors see in them a reason, um, a way to diversify their portfolios. So real assets are seen as hard or tangible assets uh, with expected lower correlation to equity-like asset classes. Um, they're also seen as something that provides uh, more uh, income than bonds uh, and superior risk-adjusted returns to equities. So basically, they're seen as something different, which would justify having a proper asset class for them. What do we do in this research agenda? Well, we basically question these assumptions. So we ask two main questions. The first one is, do private market funds really provide diversification to investors uh, with respect to listed assets as they claim to, to do? So the way we address this question is that we basically extract the drivers of private market fund returns. So we extract some time series of, uh, of private market fund returns, and we test whether those time series are correlated with public stocks. So in, in a paper, we actually go um, a little deeper than that. And we also test whether there's spanning uh, between the factors, the risk factors uh, um, that public stocks have been shown to be exposed to and the risk factors that private market funds are exposed to. But here, I'm just going to stick to, to a simple correlation analysis. What do we find? We find that most of the fund drivers are highly correlated with the S&P 500. So this is actually a surprising phenomenon in the sense that if private market funds were providing diversification as expected, then they should show a relatively low correlation with the S&P 500. Well, this is not what we find. There's an exception, however, we find that for a subset of venture capital fund, there seems to be more diversification, which is achieved. The second main question that we address is a question that's focusing on real assets. And here, what we're asking is, is there really a reason to have a specific asset class for these real assets? Are these real assets funds really real? So in the sense, uh, first, uh, do they provide any, um, do, do they provide returns which are really distinct from the returns of public stocks? And second, do they provide returns which are distinct from those of the other asset classes, namely private debt and private equity funds? And finding that we have is that, well, in short, basically they don't. So there's no real reason um, beyond, beyond the marketing reason, of course, we don't find a reason, an asset pricing reason uh, to have special asset classes for real assets. So now let's get a little bit into details. What data do we use? Well, we use um, the biggest data set that's available to academics to date. This is a data set of uh, private market fund returns, which is provided by, by Burgess. So Burgess basically collects data from the limited partners um, aggregates this data, analyzes them, provides statistics back to the limited partners. And Burgess is a database that's uh, the most comprehensive database of private market funds, as far as I know to date. It contains data for about 5,000 funds, uh, classified into uh, 12 categories. So those categories include the usual suspects, uh, uh, LBOs, venture capital, real estate, infrastructure, natural resources, etc. How does a fund uh, work? In a nutshell, uh, there's an investment period. Um, so during the investment period, the manager, the, the, the GP, the fund manager is going to call uh, funds from the investors uh, who are going to bring the, fund, uh, the funds up to a certain amount to the investor, and the investor is going to pick some uh, invest investments that he or she has been uh, identifying as profitable. This is about the first five years of the fund life. And then during the next five to seven years of the fund life, what's going to happen is that the general partner, the fund manager, is going to exit the investments when he or she uh, deems it appropriate 
and um, bring back the proceeds of these investments back to the limited partners. So what we have in the data is time series of cash flows. Uh, when, so cash inflows and cash outflows, uh, inflows from uh, the limited partner into the fund uh, and outflows uh, back from the general partner to the limited partners. So we have all the cash flows for each fund. Uh, we also have uh, the net asset values uh, as estimated by the general partners uh, uh, for each fund uh, whenever reported uh, from 1984 until the second quarter of, 18, uh, of 2018. We focus on the period starting in 2003 and the reason for this uh, is that uh, real asset funds uh, started really trading around 2003. So because one of our questions is focused on real asset funds, we just consider uh, the subsequent period. We have in terms of fund characteristics, we have the vintage year, which is the year at which the fund was raised. We have the size, which is the total amount that limited partners commit, commit to the fund, the, the geographical and the industry focus, the currency of the fund, as well as the firm experience. What we, what we, what we call the firm's experience is how many funds as this firm has been managing before. So we want to work in a dynamic setup. We don't just want to calculate uh, static measures of performance of the fund. Uh, this has been covered in the literature. So we want to calculate really a dynamic um, time, time series of returns. The way we do this is that we look at each quarter and on each quarter, we calculate the internal rate of return, taking into account uh, the initial net asset value, the final net asset value and the intermediary cash flows. We also calculate the modified internal rate of return uh, with some in assumptions on the financing and reinvestment rates, which results are basically similar. It's been shown that uh, these net asset values that we use, uh, they're actually remarkably accurate despite all the criticism uh, that is linked to them. So the, the criticism relates to the fact that they're self-declared by the fund manager. Uh, and as such, there are some biases uh, uh, due to the illiquidity of, um, of, of, of the fund investments uh, and to the difficulty to actually assess the exit value of these investments. But there's also some criticism due to potential voluntary manipulation of the net asset values. So if you think about it uh, as a fund manager, uh, there might be times where you might want to over report uh, um, the, the fund returns, for example, if you're going to raise a new fund uh, in uh, uh, the next couple of quarters, uh, there might be other times where you might want to under report those returns in order to get back to uh, the, the, the right or the fundamental value. So there's evidence of this uh, manipulation of net asset value and such a manipulation combined with the liquidity of a lot of uh, investments that uh, funds are um, uh, have, uh, all of this basically introduces some autocorrelation, some smoothing in the returns that we observe. So we need to take into account this autocorrelation, this smoothing. What we do is that we're going to use a model for fund returns, uh, which actually takes this into account explicitly and which corrects for the smoothing of fund returns. Another major problem of, um, of, of funds uh, is that categories, asset classes in which funds are classified are, um, are the result of self-classification. So it's basically done manually by some experts looking at uh, the, the flyers going with, uh, with the funds. Uh, and it is not clear at all whether the investments that are made by the fund are actually in line with the asset class uh, that's, that's uh, declared. So what we do is that we also take this into account and we have a statistical algorithm which reclassifies the funds into some statistical categories. So here I'm not going to get into detail. All I want to say is that we take into account all these different potential biases in the data explicitly in our model in order to correct for these biases. If we did not correct for these biases, um, it would actually be extremely hard to conduct a correlation analysis uh, because each of, these each of these potential data problems um, introduces their own bias, either upward or downward bias 
into the correlation uh, that we calculate after with the index. So here you have a snapshot of our time um, of our database. So there's about one third of funds, which are buyout funds, uh, about one third of funds, which are venture capital funds. About 15% um, of the database is real estate funds. And then we have the smaller categories of funds which share the remaining of the database. I'm not gonna get into detail in, in the statistics. Okay, so this is a more technical slide that I have. Uh, I'm gonna try to make it as, as explicit as I can. This basically describes the model that we're using. So here, what I wanna mention is that this model, again, is taking into account the smoothing of uh, the returns. And the way it's taking that into account is that it's basically using an, uh, a moving average process. So this is a specification of a moving average process. You can think about it uh, as, as a small variation of, a, of an autoregressive process where you have each value at each point in time that actually uh, it incorporates um, the, the, the past information, but not completely. So you have a slow incorporation of the new arriving information. So now we have a model for observed smooth returns. We have another model for true, true returns. And that model is basically, simply speaking, a factor model. So we have a, fac a group effect or a factor effect here, which is driving all the returns of all the funds within a group. And then we have a noise component. So what to remember from this slide, basically that we have a model which takes into account smoothing, uh, which also recategorizes the funds into statistical groups in order to not take as given the asset classes uh, which, which, which are declared. At least you have two, three minutes. Huh? Two, three to... minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna get directly to the, to the results then. Um, okay, so what kind of groups do we find in the data? We find mainly four groups. First group is a large equity group. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it contains a lot of large funds. It's sort of a low risk, low return um, group of, of funds. Then we have the second group, which is a large income fund. So it's even more low risk, low return, but it has very similar properties to the large equity group. The large equity group is just more focused on buyout and, um, and VC funds, while the large income group contains a large majority of the debt funds. Then we have a mid-size equity fund, which gathers a lot of the mid-size uh, buyout and uh, VC funds. And finally, we have like a subset of the VCs, which isolates in one group. Uh, oh no, what I wanted to show here, actually what's, what's pretty important is the correlations between those, the drivers of these four groups. And as you can see here, if you look at the three first groups, the correlations are actually strikingly high. So we have a correlation above seven to, from 70 to 90% between the drivers of these first three groups, which means that they're very close in terms of return trajectories uh, to one another. The only one that's really different here is a subset of venture capital funds. Those behave very differently. They have very distinct return uh, profiles. And those are the only ones which very clearly provide uh, something different from the other funds. If you look at the correlation between those drivers and the S&P 500, uh, same picture. So basically the three first groups which gather income and equity with different sizes. Uh, they're very highly correlated with the S&P 500. VC has a low correlation with um, the S&P 500, indicating that VC is the only, at least a subset of VC funds, uh, is actually the only category of funds really providing uh, something different, something diversifying compared uh, to, to public equities. Can you give us slowly the conclusion slowly? Okay, so I'm gonna jump to this slide, which basically summarizes everything. Yeah. So in terms of correlation with the S&P 500, the only group that provides something different is venture capital. In terms of risk return profile, 
venture capital has a high risk, high return profile. The others have a lower risk, low return profile. In terms of my second question, how do real asset performs? Well, in a nutshell, they're all like either equity or income, but none of them is like VC. So basically, if you look at timber funds, uh, more than 90% of them are similar to income funds. So they're basically behaving like private debts. If you look at energy funds, uh, they're behaving like equity. So basically, all the real assets have return characteristics, which are very, very similar to either equity or income, which means that in terms of diversification benefits, uh, these are not really ideal. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, but this is basically the picture that summarizes everything I've talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Yeah, it's, it's a great, nice, nice picture. Now, now we are going to uh, uh, move away from academics and go to uh, well-known practitioners and successful practitioners in the industry. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Joan Murray. Uh, he is the head of investment uh, in the Federated Hermers International, uh, and he's also in the executive committee of the company. Uh, Mr. Murray has a very long career, uh, which uh, looking over his resume, some old familiar names uh, uh, ring bells like Manny Hani. That's how we used to call uh, uh, manufacturers Hanover Trust. Uh, in the days where the, the previous two speakers were not even born, by the way. Uh, and a, a lot of, uh, like, he moved to, um, uh, to um, uh, Wells Fargo, Nico Investment, which has uh, since then been absorbed, I guess, by BlackRock. And Manny Hani was taken over by JP Morgan before it was JP Morgan, whatever, chemical bank, Chase, what have you. Anyway, he's been in the industry for a very long time. And I understand uh, if we run into deep water, then he's going to rescue us because that's what he does for a hobby. He's very involved in the city of London doing various, uh, various things. And some, some of that stuff relates to water. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Johan, please, the podium is yours. Please share with us your, your wisdom. Ikas, thank you. And uh, I'm hoping you can see that screen okay. Yes, yes. We can yes, see good. Um, so thank you, Kikas. And um, uh, um, I'm, I'm disappointed that you actually revealed the true extent of my CV. I was quite happy to ride the coattails of youth that you started the, the session with. Uh, but it, let's be honest, um, I am not of the same generation as, uh, as Elise and Nick. Um, however, I will also say that I have happily sat in lecture theatres learning from Nick, which only goes to show that you are never too old to learn. But I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that you also have, uh, you're not only in economics, but also in law. You have a law degree and business degree. He's a very diversified person. Uh, <laughs> he's the most diversified among all of us, by the way. And, and being a lawyer, he has power. Remember that. Uh, oh my gosh! Govern, govern, govern us. So, I, I would certainly lay, lay no claim to that. But thank you, and I should, I should also add my sincere thanks to George and the IFFR for inviting me to share some thoughts with you today. Um, when I understood that the theme for this two-day event was going to be uh, trends and developments in asset management for occupational pensions, it was pretty immediately clear to me that what I wanted to talk to you about was uh, ESG and its continuing journey. Uh, awareness of ESG and its further adoption grew massively last year, 2020. Uh, and by some estimates, ESG aligned investments broached the $40 trillion mark, $40 trillion in ESG, uh, kind of hard to believe. So what was driving this growth? Well, in the near term, uh, the intertwined health and economic crisis caused by the pandemic drove a rise in the demand for ESG investing, I think. Uh, as investors seem to uh, require a conscience for social issues in particular uh, that came to the fore. Longer term, I think the, the unraveling effect of the pandemic seems to have opened investors' minds to the challenges that await in terms of the climate crisis and biodiversity and ecosystem loss. 
And I say await, but of course that's not really true. Uh, these twin challenges uh, are, are with us here and now and have been for some time. Uh, it's sad that perhaps that it's only our recognition of them uh, that is in any sense uh, now. So by way of establishing uh, my credentials, uh, I thought I might cover a little bit of history of Federated Hermes. And uh, I'm only gonna draw out a couple of key dates for you, if I may. The first one I'll do, is back in 1983 when the first chief executive of uh, what was then called Postel Investment Management, essentially it was the investment manager of the Royal Mail Pension Scheme and the British Telecom Pension Scheme. Uh, the first chief exec, uh, a gentleman called Ralph Quartano, publicly called out the management of Marks and Spencers for paying themselves too much. And uh, I thought that was a great example of maybe the first piece of uh, very public uh, corporate governance and stewardship uh, that, that we had in our timeline. The second thing I wanted to mention was in 2004, when uh, we established our stewardship business, EOS, uh, as a separate entity, and just to recognize that in fact, that was some six years before the UK stewardship code came into being in 2010. And the last date I wanna draw your attention to is just a couple of years on from that in 2006. And the, uh, a lot of the drafting of the UNPRI was done by, uh, by Hermes uh, colleagues and in our building. And I'm delighted to say that we still have a, an early draft of the PRI uh, framed in our reception. And in fact, the trustee, one of the trustees of the British Telecom Pension Scheme, Donald MacDonald, a fellow countryman, actually went on to become the first chair of the PRI. So, I think it's safe to say that responsible investing and ESG have been at the core of what Hermes has offered to clients and stood for for uh, more than four decades. Now, there's no question that the terminology uh, around ESG is somewhat confusing. Uh, and I can remember attending an Inquire quantitative conference in the early 90s, where a, a bold young Dutch academic presented some conclusions uh, on SRI. Uh, it was a sceptical audience, it was, it's safe to say, and they questioned the conclusions, mainly due to, I think, lack of data. But even back then, it was fairly clear that the rewards to pension funds from uh, incorporating some understanding of what we refer to then as socially responsible items uh, could yield benefits. And since then, we've moved on to ESG investing, responsible investing, and uh, sustainable investing appears to be the, uh, the word, uh, words du jour. Uh, and many use, of course, those terms interchangeably. We used to talk about ESG factors uh, as though they were non-financial or extra-financial. I heard both of those terms. But I think today most people would agree that, in fact, they are very financial. Uh, we also attempted to define the implications of ESG in terms of externalities. But I think, again, uh, most people would accept that they are very much more than simply some consequence of an industrial activity uh, which may affect other par parties. Uh, I would put it to you that ESG is at the root, at the very heart, uh, at the source of all investing. Asset managers, of course, <clears throat> never wants to miss an opportunity, uh, responded to the demand for strategies in this space from asset owners, including pension funds, uh, and by developing a whole swathe of product offerings that sit on this spectrum of priority in terms of returns to society. In some sense, uh, this suggests that we've progressed from a narrow view in which only pure financial metric, metrics derived from traditional balance sheet, P&L or cash flow statements mattered. And now we are in a world in which uh, a more holistic view of financial returns is taken. Of course, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, there have been commercial drivers too. Uh, some 40% of investors now profess to be ESG aligned although I'd hazard that there's a fair degree of heterogeneity in the depth of alignment. I recall speaking to a consultant friend a few years back who commented that then there were less than 200 funds in the universe that they tracked that professed to be sustainable or responsible. Uh, when we last got up, uh, they numbered well into the thousands. Uh, and we should recognize as much as that probably represents some genuine progress, there will be some instances of a relabeling uh, without perhaps due change, uh, a practice that we could call greenwashing. Um, if I may, let me review why it is that we actually care about ESG investing. 
I want to move forward that there are at least four strong reasons why ESG investing and stewardship uh, have become so prevalent and why they matter. First, because reputation became a key driver and beneficiaries focused on their moral stance and their ethical beliefs. Back in the 90s, this started with a view taken on South Africa under then apartheid regime, and then tobacco came under the spotlight. And subsequently, you could find any number of UN conventions uh, against certain activities that some, if not many, will find repugnant. Secondly, investors have become increasingly aware that there are risks associated with ESG factors that have to be taken into account. Uh, in climate change terms, we group these into physical, transition, and societal factors. And we know that the necessary reduction in the use of fossil fuels that is required for our planet to survive will lead eventually to stranded assets, for example. Thirdly, the canny investor sensed an opportunity. And with one eye to the future, a link was made between longer term financial returns and matters of sustainability. Never more has that been validated than in the current pandemic, where it's clear that the most resilient companies have outperformed. Lastly, the seers of our industry have spotted a wider impact of their actions, and they understood that in a world where there are explicit planetary boundaries, a social license to operate actually matters. And what does the academic literature tell us? A well-known meta-study from 2015, authored by my colleague, Dr. Michael Wies, and two other co-authors, collected some fairly comprehensive evidence from other academic work, all pointing to reductions in costs and improvements in performance. We first published our own study uh, of the return to ESG factors for equities back in 2012. And here uh, I'm sharing with you uh, the results from the 2018 update. Uh, and had I been a little bit more patient, I could have shared with you the results that we have just updated and published this morning up to 2020. In this latest version, uh, the return to a factor mimicking portfolio that emphasizes environmental characteristics uh, is now both positive and statistically significant at 13 basis points, so quite a leap. Uh, the social element offered 17 basis points, and while governance held steady at plus 24 basis points per month. The results that we observed are not unique to the equity markets, I should add. They hold for the research that we've also done in liquid credit markets. And similarly, in yet more research that we've published on government bonds, asset-backed securities, and even in private debt. Lastly, sharing our vast history of engagement activity, we've worked with a number of academics to demonstrate the relative outperformance to stewardship activity. And additionally, again, with academic partners, we can show that engagement does not primarily depend on the size of a holding, but rather on the manner in which engagement takes place and with whom. One cannot settle for chatting with the investor relations department. A true engagement involves discussions with the board, the non-exec directors, and the C-suite. Let me now turn to how it all gets done in practice. And in truth, there is no one size fits all. And asset owners such as pension funds will need to make sense of a variety of different approaches and work out which one best aligns with what they would like, would like to achieve. We believe that investment is actually two activities rolled into one. Firstly, the allocation of capital, whether by purchasing an equity ownership stake in a company, acquiring an infrastructure concession, building and managing a property development or lending money. And secondly, by being a good steward of that capital once the capital has been deployed. What that means is that we have a team of highly experienced investment professionals who work with a separate group of dedicated engagers. They tell me that their best meetings with companies are joint ones, where the questioning of each side drives the insight for the other. There is nothing magic in ESG data. It's all publicly available, but it does require careful understanding and handling that can really only be done with years of experience. I want to spend a little bit of time on our stewardship activity, as it is the less well-known and understood component of investing. At the beginning of each year, we work with our clients, uh, many of them pension funds, and together with the investment floor, we come up with a set of desired 
engagement objectives for the coming year. We set goals for each one and then measure ourselves against those goals. We may have different levels of engagement depending on how serious a particular issue being tackled is. And then throughout the year, we will adjust that plan as new material issues surface. You won't be entirely surprised uh, to learn that much of our corporate engagement work is linked in some way to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the SDGs themselves, of course, were developed as, a, as state level aspirations, but the 169 underlying targets yield rich hunting ground for corporate engagement by investors. Being a good steward of capital does not solely involve proxy voting. There is far more to it than that. Uh, we also find that engagement as a debt holder matters as well. After all, lenders too have an interest in enterprise value. And it doesn't stop there. As a property manager, being a good steward of capital matters too. I'm sure that prior to the lockdown, many of you will have had cause to travel through the regenerated King's Cross area in London. Not only did that redevelopment return more than 20% annualized to our former majority pension fund owner, but it's also achieved a number of other developments that made it far more than just a financial success. Apprenticeships drawn from the local community, a school for deaf children, and an open air venue for music and gatherings, to name just a few. Let me share a couple of stock engagement examples with you. Um, I've had to anonymize both, uh, but as both companies' uh, names involve just two initials, I'm fairly certain that you'll figure out what is what. First up, one of the uh, larger global oil and gas super majors with whom we've had an engagement history going back over 12 years. Admittedly, progress has been slower than we might have liked, but 2019 felt like a break year through for our work with this company. Uh, and noticeable environmental objectives were achieved. In 2020, they became the first oil major to announce a net zero carbon emissions target. It's not perfect, but it's a positive outcome and a step in the right direction. Then we have our engagement history with a well-known German car manufacturer that was found to have illegally falsified their emissions testing output. In 10 years of working with them, we have seen a change from a company that seemed reluctant to face reality and in fact tried to sidestep the issue to one which today is fully engaged. We've high hopes for future engagement with respect to achieving further emissions reductions and ending their lobbying activity. This engagement timeline for that company gives you a sense of the different levels of activity involved. There are a couple of other trends and developments that I wanted to touch on before I wrap up. <clears throat> um, I mentioned that the issue of greenwashing is a serious one for our issue. And I can imagine that for pension funds, it's not easy to discern good from bad, real from fake. But I hope that after today's talk, you will have a decent sense of what that might look like. Perfect is going to be difficult, but a genuine commitment to ESG investing should run through everything that a firm does at the corporate level, at the portfolio level, and at the individual holding level. We've developed a range of tools that we use ourselves on our investment floor and that we can share with clients to help them how, assess, uh, how to assess how effective our ESG and engagement integration is. And as we turn our minds to issues beyond climate change, we'll continue to develop additional tools in the sphere of biodiversity uh, and ecosystem loss, for example. Let me wrap up by highlighting just a few themes that are still playing out in this space and which I think will be super important to watch. The question of strict fiduciary obligations remains a thorny one for pension funds. Is ESG a nice to have or an absolute necessity? I would argue strongly that with the time horizon adjusted appropriately to one that makes sense for a pension fund, considerations of ESG are absolutely essential. It would seem that the incoming Biden, Biden administration is of light mind, and I expect that the Department of Labor will deliver a new line of thinking for ERISA, ERISA pension arrangements. We talked a little bit about data earlier and its importance, and we know that the correlations between different data providers for ESG information 
on the same universe are much lower than we would like. But we also know why. Different providers choose different items as measures. Where they use the same measure, they have different metrics to capture them. And then they also apply weightings differently to different measures. However, I firmly believe that that only matters if one is interested in some form of aggregate company ESG score. And I would suggest that maybe such aggregate scores are of low relevance, uh, although there may be some information uh, in their change over time. Instead, I want to argue that the devil will be in the detail. For any given corporate, there may only be a short handful of really material issues, and asset managers and owners must focus on these. Although disclosure of ESG information has been improving globally, there's still far too much variability. Uh, this is, of course, leads to an invitation for regulators to step in, and indeed, that's what's happened. The EU will keep us busy with sustainability-related disclosures and the non-financial reporting directive based on their taxonomy. In the UK, TCFD-aligned information moves to a complier explain regime in June this year. In India, SEBI has approved a new business responsibility and sustainability report for the top 1,000 listed entities. And in Thailand, disclosure on ESG topics will become mandatory from the end of this year in annual reports. There are many, many more examples. This regulation is necessary because, let's face it, we've been too slow to agree upon and set minimum standards. And I, but I do also worry about the unintended consequences of such regulation. I fear that a ratings and labels industry will rise on the back of this legislation and that it will not meet its intended purpose. Watch out too for the accountants, change is coming. The IFRS Foundation, the body that oversees the work of the International Accounting Standards Board, is proposing setting up a parallel sustainability standards board. And if that comes to fruition, the SSB would make it possible for the holy grail of integrated reporting to be achieved, where the relationship between strict financial performance is clearly linked to sustainability outcomes. Our industry, the asset management industry, is, revolving, is evolving rapidly in response to meet this new challenge of investor demand for all things ESG. Uh, but how is that going to play out? Well, from my perspective, the truly interesting commercial question revolves around which parts of ESG can or should sit alongside active management and which parts actually fit better with passive approaches. I believe that the use of backward looking historical ESG data lends itself well to a passive approach and there may be scope for systematic players to forecast forward such information and quantitative strategies. But the active industry can justify its worth in superior understanding of that ESG information and genuine application of stewardship. Exclusions and divestments remain a hot topic too. And having wrestled with uh, this topic internally for the last year and a half at Federated Termes, I can assure you that it's a pretty controversial one too. It's a complex issue, one that requires a great deal of thought to ensure that you get a coherent outcome. And as with any, many things in the ESG space, the devil will be in the detail. Let me give you an example. You can grab the headlines with a ban on thermal coal, but if you then in the detail set the threshold for that activity at 25% of revenue, you fail to capture any of the five biggest companies that are engaged in that activity. That bold exclusion becomes worthless and should be called out, quite frankly, for being so. I also want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the acronym is ESG, not CSG, as in climate, social and governance issues. I firmly believe that the tragedy we face with biodiversity and ecosystem loss intertwined with the climate crisis must also be tackled by investors and pension funds today. Doing nothing is simply not an option. But we have tools at our disposal and their time has come. Take the world of fixed income. Green bonds have steadily become a feature and their issuance grew considerably in 2020. Putting project related instruments to one side though, I want to talk about sustainability linked bonds, those that relate interest payments to outcomes against pre-specified ESG targets. And that must surely be the way forward. Imagine if everyone on this Zoom today committed to not purchasing any new issues that were not performance linked to ESG factors. The transformation would be incredible. 
ladies and gents, let me uh, leave you with that thought. In the investment industry, we've got huge responsibilities for the capital that we manage to the end beneficiaries that have entrusted us. Huge challenges lie ahead, and to tackle climate change and biodiversity and ecosystems loss, we need a systems approach. Thank you for listening, and back to you, Gikas. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. It was very refreshing to hear what uh, you said. Here in continental Europe, by the way, Christine Lagarde is making sure that ESG is on top of the agenda, so we're not going to forget it. Uh, I'll start uh, uh, with the questions, and the first question is for, for you, uh, Johan, and please uh, let's have quick answers. The, the first question is someone is uh, asking one of the person in the audience, are there any particular sectors that you would, you would focus on to generate attractive ESG returns? In other words, do you, uh, do you perceive the sector is more favorable to uh, generating those returns? Because uh, I think the short answer is yes, uh, there, will be se- there will be sectors which will thrive in the new economy uh, and equally those that will uh, fare less well. Uh, I think you could make a case that uh, uh, tar sands uh, uh, and uh, thermal coal probably have no place uh, in the future and classic examples of, of uh, sectors where there'll be stranded assets. Equally, uh, let's not forget there will be companies that uh, originally started out in fossil fuels like Orsted, uh, used to be known as Danish oil and natural gas, that transformed themselves completely. And uh, they are their revenue is less than 5% today from uh, fossil fuels. It's mostly renewables wind generated. Just to, to double this question, just uh, I'll be very quickly, since we this, this topic, we're talking about pension funds. Uh, in your experience, is it is it true that pension funds are more sensitive to ESG issues and they invest more, they allocate more of their stuff relative to the other funds, uh, to the rest of the industry or not? Yes, I think it is. Uh, I think it is true, Gigas. And, and the reason I think it's true is because pension funds have a natural long-term horizon. And I think if you really want to appreciate the impact of ESG issues, you have to adopt that pension fund horizon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me, because we are running out of time, uh, unless George gives us time, he's the master. <laughs> uh, there's a question for Nick, and the question uh, is, is the following. Is there any product that unifies the protection strategies that you have shown? A, a product with a given maturity that a rel- relatively small pension fund could buy to protect itself from a sharp down, downward movement of the market. Uh, putting it in, in your term, is there any standardized car insurance for small cars? Nick. Um, so I would probably say yes, uh, taking into account the fact that there's always an objective and a utility function to customize the solution. If the question is more about whether it's something off the shelf, um, this is probably more for, uh, for an asset manager that has like a product off the shelf for tail risk protection. Uh, if it's more about a customized solution that can be uh, designed for, for a small pension fund, absolutely so. Like there's a, there's a range of, of, of solutions we build for these type of institutions. Uh, and, and some of the simpler ones would be, I'm going to use like a technical term, but like a collar, uh, effectively buying downside protection, paying, uh, but, but, but financing it by giving up um, some of the upside. So certainly there is, uh, and obviously with the limitation of, of, of um, I guess, specification at the moment, I would, I would suggest that there is. Okay, I, I don't see any, uh, can I ask my question here? When, when you were speaking, I always wonder, worried about the horizon you're thinking about, because uh, is your horizon the next month or the next year, or is it longer? And especially, I got worried when you mentioned bonds. You know, bonds like they're already uh, priced priced very high, and it, it's someone who thinks about investing w- wants to stay away from them because it's like they, they only see downside loss in bonds from now on. But uh, yeah, is this but, but, uh, what's your horizon? I mean, are you simply finding tricks to make sure because you concentrated on like almost like generating almost like a safe asset with uh, some extra premium? That's what that's your strategy, it appeared to me. Is, is, 
Therefore, you do have a longer horizon. You want to give people income. Somehow they want to feel secure they have income. So do you really have a long horizon or you only look at short-term movements and try to get rid of the wiggles from the return? So I think, I think the question is more on the income side then, uh, rather yeah, than yeah, the yeah. side. Uh, so there's no specific, um, if you like, determination of a horizon. But to your point, we're trying to isolate investment themes that can generate carry, as in an expectation of return that we know at the outset. And what we try to limit is the downside risk. We recognize that there is downside risk. So ultimately, the question is, how can we minimize the spot contribution when we build a carry solution. And when we look into carry signals, to your, you know, to your question explicitly, if we look into a futures market, we can look into, let's say, the next month or the next three months, what's the expected yield we can harvest by buying a futures contract that is going to converge into the spot and control, however, the exposure we have to global growth. So it's a, if you like, it's, it's a game between maximizing income but also being conscious of the fact that there is some downside risk that is embedded in it. So, and that, that's really the challenge. And, and you're thinking though, you're not worried about issues like will inflation come back in two years or after, you're not worried about these big things, longer things. No, so this is actually a super, super important point, uh, precisely because this is creating the issue. The issue is that bonds and equities in a balanced portfolio have been diversifying against each other. The current issue is that if we see an inflation spike in above Fed expectations, it's going to be bad news for bond prices as well as equity prices. And the equity bond correlation is going to flip into positive and all those funds are going to get hammered. So by looking into defensive solutions, then my, in my, 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 my first point and more contractual features, we also want to focus in this regard. So there's related issues, um, not necessarily for the income front, but certainly a consideration, absolutely. I think it's the, you know, once you treat the defensive and the income, the next big thing that I'm expecting next year to be the big theme is, is inflation hedging. Uh, now I'm going to switch to Elise. Um, you compared, uh, one of people in the audience uh, says, you compared the returns of private versus public equity, but pension funds choose private assets primarily for lower drawdowns. Uh, on a reported basis relative to returns. Have you looked at comparing drawdowns? And if so, what did you see? Um, no, so we, we focused specifically on the returns because we wanted to look at, um, we wanted to apply asset pricing techniques and look at the diversifying effects of, of um, of, of private equity. So that's that's definitely something that's, uh, that's important. It wasn't, it wasn't part of this study. So um, I want to emphasize the fact also that, um, so I compared returns, we co we're comparing returns of private equity and returns of public equity, but the message was not to say that private equity had absolutely no value. So the message was to say private equity is something that grew increasingly popular and people have all these beliefs that private equity can diversify and we're trying to question this, this hypothesis. Um, so there's definitely a lot of other things uh, looking at drawdowns is one of them. We're also looking at uh, liquidity premia which are associated to, to, to private markets. Uh, there's fees, so that's an important, uh, an important topic also, and that's very different between private markets and public markets. All these things, we're sort of looking at it into a little more detail in the papers. But uh, what we've been looking at specifically so far is really the time series of returns. OK. I, I don't see any other. Let me see. OK. I guess I had uh, my my big question for you was exactly on the issue of liquidity yes, you, you just mentioned. Yes, George, do we have any more questions? Do you yes, want to ask something? Yes, there should be. Uh, in I your, don't see any. In your box. Uh, now I lost them. Sorry. Uh, let me let me. Send why, why, why don't you, uh, George, take over? If you see some questions, please ask them because I was only seeing uh, uh, these three, four. Okay, let me check. I mean, there are plenty of questions here. Uh, okay, so there is one for uh, Yoin. 
So uh, pension funds have an important role in mitigating the impact of climate change and facilitating the transition to a more sustainable and resilient economy. What are the prerequisites to drive the sustainability agenda forward in occupational schemes, especially in countries like Greece? So George, thank you for that. Um, I think the first thing to do is to set policy. Uh, I think that's the first thing that pension funds uh, should be concentrating on. Decide uh, and agree on the outcomes that they would like to see achieved, and then work out what range of investments will, uh, will, will give them the best chance of getting to those outcomes. Okay. Um, there is Gikas, do you see questions? I, I, no, I don't. Ask? I don't see my screen. Okay. You must have it. Let me uh, continue. Let me continue with one more for Nick, and then I'll try to submit again some more to you. So uh, the submitted question to Nick is: Your strategies can only be appreciated by the more sophisticated pension funds. Do you see differences in terms of sophistication between countries? Which are the most sophisticated? Great question. Yes. So um, the whole systematic space, uh, even though in the academic side has been, um, uh, if you like, studied for, for decades, um, it, it has only become a proper, uh, if you like, field of investing in the, um, you know, if you like, in the real economy over the last 10 years. Uh, the Nordics, were, the Nordic pension funds were the first ones to start. There was like a big report in 2009 uh, by three, three academics on, on how the, the Norwegian uh, fund uh, should be allocating and should be managing risk. And that, if you like, created a, um, if you like, an evolution in the way that we think about diversification instead of across the classes, more so across risk factors and, and, and if you like, risk sources of return. Uh, so the Nordics has been, have been the first important players. The Canadians picked up, the Australians next. And currently, obviously, we see an evolution uh, throughout Europe, um, you know, Japan, and so on. Regarding the sophistication, so it's now like a global theme. You know, we have uh, conversations anywhere from like Japan, Korea to to to, to the Middle East and and, and Brazil uh, and and even Chile. Um, in terms of the sophistication, of course, there's like a, a, a great variety of, of sophistication that is typically addressed in a number of ways. Either there's a new team that takes over the management of alternative solutions, or depending on the on the setup and sometimes the regulation there is a um, need for a fiduciary. So an asset manager would have to step in to, to, to if you like, take on the fiduciary role of managing the, you know, the allocations. And that is also part of the, of the sophistication being handed over to the manager rather than you know, being, uh, being sourced in-house. So uh, there's a wide spectrum. Okay, thanks. Uh, you... I see, Georgia, I see one question okay. for, for uh, Joanne, which is about forward-looking behavior. Isn't forward-looking scenario analysis an extremely challenging task for corporations as well as a difficult transition? How can it be done efficiently? Uh, uh, someone from in the audience asks. Uh, another really good question. So uh, absolutely, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult task to do that sort of scenario analysis work, most of which comes under, if I've understood correctly, the integrated asset modeling uh, uh, sphere. And there are uh, a number of universities around the world, uh, many of them in Europe, which are doing great work, often in collaboration with one another, in terms of producing open source uh, uh, research, uh, which allows corporates to do that forward looking modeling, which is which is necessary. Um, I would say it's at the fairly early stages uh, for asset managers. It's a, it's an open field. Uh, we're only bit just beginning to truly scratch the surface of it, but it's the key to getting it right. Uh, but I'll, I'll go back to what I said right at the beginning, that in many senses, I fear that if we are waiting to get it exactly right, uh, perfect will be the enemy of good. Okay, okay. Uh, George, I don't see any other questions. Do you have more on your screen? Uh, there are many Please more. Ask. There are many more. Uh, we'll need to stop at some point, but let's, uh, I guess this can be probably the last one. Again, is this is for Yoin. 
So ESG requirements may be seen as an internalization of companies' economic externalities, imposing increased costs of equity and debt to non-complying companies. Do you fear that this could affect investments and supply by impacted companies slash sectors, ending up con consumers paying a much higher price for still much needed product products slash commodities? Uh, another goodie. Uh, so George, I don't for a second think that we're going to do this uh, overnight, which is why I am at heart a believer in engagement and stewardship. And we need, we need, come, we need corporates on side and we, meet, we need them to be making adjustments. Inevitably, they will be gradual, but we all have a good understanding of the paths that get us to where we need to be with respect to climate change, biodiversity loss. Um, we are clearly very aware that there are tipping points that we possibly don't fully understand, which uh, may change some of those trajectories. So uh, even though, even, even with what we know today, we will still have to be prepared to make changes and adjustments as we go forward. Um, so I'm not for one second uh, suggesting that we all transfer to a new economy overnight. I think you need to be a bit more realistic than that. But there are lots of things that we can be doing. Uh, uh, George, uh, can uh, because I sort of uh, cut cut off Elise very very abruptly and didn't let her finish on her time. Does she have anything more to say to? Uh, that uh, she didn't have time to, to explain. Yeah, so let me wrap up, I guess, the essence of a couple of questions. So this can be the last, so we can conclude with a lady here. Uh, so basically, uh, and that's actually a question of mine, given that uh, you know pension funds promote investments in uh, private equity and uh, real assets like uh, real estate, is it fair to say, judging from your findings, that this seems to be a myth and pension funds should not invest in this kind of assets and asset classes? We should be very careful and be aware that um, these, these assets don't just provide like not just a miracle investment like some uh, want to make believe. So in terms of what I wanted to emphasize is that they might be as good as they seem to be. It doesn't mean that they're not good, uh, good investments. So there's a whole debate on their, the value. So, um, so I, I didn't talk to, to this. Um, uh, there's, there's, other debates, data risk which are associated to it. So this goes back to the previous question drawdown. Uh, this is actually uh, part of, of some research where risk associated to private equity that that investors need to be aware of. So what I, what I, I want to answer your question: pension funds. Are, should consider invest, investing in private equity, but they should be very well aware of the risks, which are the limitations of the benefits that are also coming together with that. Okay. okay well, let me, let me wrap it up. We had a great session, I think. I thank uh, all three participants. Uh, they answered all questions. They, uh, uh, widened our horizons. <laughs> I mention horizon because I always think of the future. Some of us, the older crowd, start counting in reverse, you know, you do what is our horizon, it's sort of reaching a wall. So uh, thank you all. And now, George, uh, I give it to you to continue with the panel, the, the, the next panel. Thanks a lot. Thank very much. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you all. Uh, you can stay if you wish. Um, it's up to you. Uh, so uh, thanks, Elise. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Join. Thanks, Gika. So now we're ready to move on to uh, the final part of uh, the conference, which is the panel discussion. So the panel is going to be moderated by uh, Ms. Artemis Panagiotopoulou. So Artemis is uh, the chief executive officer of uh, DECT, 
uh, she's a CEO since 2014, and uh, she has um, uh, a big experience in the industry for the past uh, 17 years uh, in pension funds mainly, and uh, more broadly institutional investors. She's with a DECT since uh, 2002. And uh, actually we are delighted to, to have Artemis in the past as um, a postgraduate student in, uh, in our department in the University of Piraeus. So Artemis, uh, it's over to you. Uh, sorry, we took you uh, five to 10 minutes. Feel free to accommodate it as you wish. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea is uh, for the audience, feel free to submit more questions for the panelists. And um, uh, we assure you that we'll have time for Q&A with you as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Artemis. Great. Well, um, thank you, George, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to moderate today's uh, roundtable panel, um, which wraps up IFFR's uh, two-day conference. Um, uh, I'd like to thank IFFR for organizing such an interesting and appealing event. So um, today's panel will focus on occupational pensions, uh, lessons and practices. We're gonna uh, touch upon a lot of topics that were talked about um, uh, both in yesterday's session and earlier today. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two distinguished panelists, Dr. Guy Coughlin and uh, Mr. Fibus Kadzis. I'll start with um, Dr. Guy Coughlin, which has a uh, vast experience in, uh, and we're very um, interested in hearing his insights. Um, uh, so um, Dr. Guy Coughlin is Valuation Program Executive and former Chief Risk Officer for the University Superannuation Scheme in the UK. Uh, he's been with the USS um, uh, since 2015 as Chief, Chief Risk Officer and member of their executive team. Um, he has uh, set up the group's risk function um, and the overall framework uh, for risk management of USS. Um, since 2019, he is valuation program executive, leading a team of executives focusing on delivering all aspects of valuation, actuarial, investment, stakeholder management. Previously, he spent 17 years at JP Morgan, where he had several senior global roles. Um, uh, he finished as managing director and European head of the pension advisory group. Uh, there, he was a member of the risk metrics team, so he led the development of one of the world's first uh, general purpose uh, risk management frameworks. Um, and he also helped to found a fiduciary management business for US pension plans. Um, he holds a PhD from Oxford University, a degree from the University of Western Australia, and an MBA from Henley Business School. So um, quite a large uh, introduction there, so it's good to have you, Guy. Pleasure. And uh, also we have with us Fivos Khadziz, Chairman of the Investment Committee of Ilkos um, Investments, um, Alternative Investment Fund Managers in Greece. Um, he has, Fivos has uh, over 20 years of, of professional experience in the financial sector. At Ilkos, he streamlines and synchronizes the investments of various asset classes in multiple por company portfolios. Prior to Ilkos, he was Head of Market Making and Prop Trading at NBG Securities. Um, he also in the past worked uh, with uh, Vodafone Greece as treasurer and worked in Credit Suisse for Boston in Boston. So um, he has a very in-depth knowledge of the financial industry as well, both abroad and uh, in Greece. Um, so today, um, I think uh, our discussion God, will, will be interactive. Yes, well, today it's, it's great to have you both. Um, we're going to try and make this discussion as interactive as possible. Um, now, we're going to talk about several issues that have been touched upon um, earlier today and during yesterday's session. So a little bit about asset allocation, investment strategies, risk management. Um, then we'll talk about a little bit about the design of occupational pension schemes and the regulatory framework. And uh, I'll try to, um, to ask you to provide your personal insights on the practicalities on how all these issues are um, applied in practice. So um, I think it's good to start with uh, you know, the segment of asset allocation investment strategies. And I'll start by commenting on a very interesting uh, debate yesterday between Dr. Uh, Mr. Theodoros Ikonomu and David McCarthy who had a very interesting debate on the trade-off between active and passive strategies, passive low cost, active uh, both on the private equity and less liquid side. So um, uh, Guy, I'll start with you. Can you give us your, your opinion on this? Uh, certainly, Artemis. Um, I think I like to think about the active versus passive debate as one between discretion 
and rules-based approaches. And, and sort of a passive investment is just one example of a rules-based approach. And I think they both have their own particular niches within uh, pension plans. Um, you know, clearly, as, as we uh, heard yesterday, you know, active management works in some markets. Um, and uh, USS takes, my pension fund takes uh, an active approach uh, where it adds value. So, for example, in, in uh, emerging markets, uh, active management does work for both debt and equity, um, and it can give added value. Um, however, in other markets, it's different, such as, um, you know, it's difficult to, build, uh, to beat the S&P 500 index. Um, you know, this is an index that gives you exposure to the growth and size factors, um, is a very efficient market, certainly much more efficient than most. And when there is a bull market, as there was, for example, in the late 1990s, it's virtually impossible to beat with active management. Um, however, when markets are dislocated with the kind of dislocation we saw with COVID uh, or the global financial crisis, um, it can create opportunities for active funds. Um, these may not last very long, but it, it suddenly does become easier to, to beat markets. Um, there are other places where you're forced to use active management because there aren't passive alternatives and, uh, and it's necessary to, uh, to invest in, a, in an active way, even if you would prefer uh, to be passive. Um, so, so we're very much uh, believers in active management as a way of adding value and the track record of, um, of our investment team has, uh, you know, has reflected considerable uh, value added over the course of, uh, you know, certainly the last five to 10 years. Great. So I'm um, touching upon that being confident on your team. Guy, um, you know, given that with USS is one of the largest, if not the largest uh, pension schemes in the UK, uh, what do you think are the most important criteria for manager evaluation and selection, given that someone opts for actions, active strategies? Um, I don't know. So I, I like to think of it in terms of, uh, you know, the five P's that it's, um, you can't narrow it down to any one particular issue, but it's a combination of, you know, the people, the philosophy for investment, the process for investment, the portfolio and how it's managed and then performance. And you've really got to look at all of those. I think some of the, the more recent changes we've seen to the process of, um, of manager selection of, of, uh, of active managers is the, um, the team that's doing the research really getting in to understand uh, the investment philosophy and the investment process. And this means you know, uh, understanding things like the factor allocations for equity portfolios, understanding in detail the algorithms for systematic strategies, uh, getting down into a lot of detail, which is greatly assisted by the advances we've seen in technology. Um, it's also been, uh, there's been an effort to increasingly integrate ESG criteria into the manager search uh, process. And this is, this is something that is still um, a journey. Clearly, it's not complete where um, the industry is making steps in this direction, but that will become, uh, it has become and will become even more important in the future. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and clearly there's an assistance on transparency that you, know, you need to get transparency, not just on the investment process, but on fees and charges and costs. Um, and the whole process is really helped by the, uh, what we've seen in advances in terms of technology, which can help us screen a lot more asset managers than we, we could in the past. And then it can help us uh, understand their strategies, um, look at their performance and decompose, deconstruct their performance where they're really making money and where they're not, uh, what decisions are profitable, what decisions are value, um, value negative, um, and look at it in a whole. Um, but if you just narrow it down to the investment question, you know, it's really about uh, once you've got the people philosophy and process right, you know, can they really deliver alpha? That's the important question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the million dollar question, I think. <laughs> Whether they can actually, and, and how long they, and how consistently can alpha be delivered? In a um, Great. So, um, Exactly, sustainability. Um, so my next question is, um, and it has to do with a lot that has been discussed uh, during the conference up till now. So allocation to fixed income um, assets, 
was uh, uh, until now uh, the traditional way to match liabilities. Within the current low, um, even negative interest rate environment, the search for yield has led people down the credit line or even um, into higher equity exposures. So how do you think occupational pension schemes balance between these two investment options? Um, Guy, let's start with you and people, so I'd like your insight on that as well later on. Certainly, okay. Um, so let me start by thinking about defined benefit pension pension funds first, and then we'll come to defined contribution. Um, so defined benefit pension plans face asset liability risk, which is essentially a combination of two broad risk classes. On the one hand, you've got uh, growth assets, which are equity risks. And on the other side, you've got liabilities, which are interest rate and inflation risks. And um, the job of the, of the DB pension plan is to manage that package of risks. Hedging liability risks with matching assets enables you to get rid of uh, the interest rate and inflation risks, or at least part of them, and, and thereby for the same risk budget allocate more to growth assets. Um, but the trouble is, as, as you rightly pointed out, Artemis, the um, matching assets are very expensive at the moment. They have very low returns, um, but there are things we can do to manage this. And what we can do is not think about going for the mathematically pure hedge. It's not a matter of perfectly offsetting risk. It's a matter of mitigating risk, reducing risk. So in, in, in doing that, you can move up the credit spectrum, uh, taking more credit risk. You can also move up the credit spectrum, uh, up the uh, liquidity spectrum and take more liquid illiquidity risk. So by moving into corporate bonds, by moving into um, uh, you know, uh, private loans, uh, private credit, uh, you can get to a, to a situation where uh, you get broad offset of liability related risks, but with a, uh, with a higher return. You can also um, take a different approach or a, indeed a complementary approach um, and use leverage to hedge the liabilities. So you can do that through swaps, depending on the market, swaps, repo, other ways to doing that. Um, and the advantage of leverage, provided it's controlled and, and, and limited and you can manage collateral, is that you don't use up too much of the fund's capital. So you can still invest in the growth assets you, you need to generate your, your uh, target return. Um, but you can, at the same time, sort of hedge the liabilities and, and, and stay invested in growth. Now, what the balance is depends on the pension plan. How mature it is, that is, you know, is it closed? Is it open? Is it growing? Um, and how much risk capacity the sponsor has and what, what the sponsor's appetite is to use that risk capacity. And, you know, pension funds don't have capital in a formal sense like a, an insurance company, uh, at least not in the UK. Um, however, there is implicit capital there that is a... a, a a contingent call on the sponsor. And um, sponsor's risk appetite needs to be prepared to put up that, uh, that, uh, those assets when they're called. Um, and if the sponsor is strong, uh, they can take more risk. If the sponsor isn't so strong, uh, then, then that balance would be very different. Now, just finally, I think, I think for DB, sorry, defined contribution pension plans, the situation is similar you still have an asset liability risk, but now the liability risk is, the, is really the consumption profile of each individual member in retirement. And the member owns that risk and needs to manage the growth of their pot of uh, assets uh, relative to uh, meeting that, uh, that consumption need in, in the future, which is, a, which is of course inflation linked. Um, so, so, so there is a similar, uh, consideration to to be uh, uh, to be made, but uh, but clearly it needs to be done in a very different way, given it's the individual uh, owning and managing that risk. Mm -hmm. Great, um, Fivos, your view on this? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we I start with a simple observation: a global inflationary policy has taken some risk out of assets, so the some particular asset classes are good for yield pickups. For example, the emerging market senior debt is reasonably priced and delivers the yield we're looking for. 
Two, tactical allocation and positive slope of US yield curve offers yield pickup as well. Uh, why? This short segment is under financial repression. The long term is more market driven. So bottom line is you can exploit the central bank policies and make in some yield out of them. If you are allowed from your fiduciary allocation, you can go out of fixed income, especially in high dividend stocks with visibility and return of cash policies. Uh, for example, industrial, banking, and energy sectors. Uh, another also very common way to diversify your yield is to sell covered calls writing, especially when high vol will pick up. Bottom line, there is some, some enhancement to do on the yield chapter. And um, I think should the allocation is flexible, you can go aggressively out of the developed capital markets and going ahead with some element of risk that hopefully will deliver the alpha you need. Back to you, Artemy. Great. Okay, so um, apart from going either further down the credit line or increasing equity exposures from developed to emerging, another big theme and another way to enhance the diversification of the portfolio are alternative assets. Um, so until recently, real estate and commodities were considered primary section of an alternative investment portfolio, given their low correlation with um, uh, equity and bond-like performances. Um, however, um, as highlighted during the, um, uh, the present crisis, uh, when there's a structural demand to shock, su such asset classes might not present um, protection, and they actually did um, exhibit significant downside uh, risks. So um, I'll follow up on a question that was uh, made to Dr. Elise Gouyer um, earlier today, um, um, you know, on her very interesting presentation on the, the, the um, transformation from public to private markets. So um, do you see a shift to other alternative asset classes that can exhibit a better risk return trade-off within a well-diversified pension portfolio, such as let's say hedge funds, private equity, infrastructure? And how does this affect the liquidity of the portfolio? Guy, do you want to start? <laughs> uh, certainly. Um, yes, look, there, there has been a, a big move um, from pension funds in the UK into, uh, into private assets over the last five years in particular. Um, and this has run across the full spectrum um, of private assets, debt and equity, uh, infrastructure, um, and, and uh, various other, other uh, kinds of private investments. And USS has been a, a long time investor in private, in private assets. Um, infrastructure in particular is, is interesting for pension funds because uh, very often you don't just get stable returns, but you get inflation protection, uh, which depending on how the, the asset is, uh, is regulated can be explicit or it can just be implicit. Um, I think the other advantage for, for, for large pension funds like, like us is we, we can actually buy direct stakes in, in these assets, uh, which not only give you the uh, exposure uh, to the investment, but um, they often get, get, can get you a seat on the board and therefore an opportunity to help influence the future risk reward profile of the business and also ensure there's better alignment with the objectives of the of the pension fund, um, but but clearly liquidity is is an issue. Um, we are lucky; we are an open pension plan. We are still growing. Uh, we are cash flow positive, so more money is coming in each month than is being paid out. So liquidity is less of an issue than it would be for a very mature plan that was perhaps closed to uh, to new entrants and to future accrual. Um, now, because of this, we have an exposure to private assets, which is something just under 30% uh, of our asset portfolio. We could go higher. Uh, we, we think that's you know, pretty close to the right level at the moment. Um, if, you, um, if you look at other pension funds in the UK, for example, Nest, which is the government workplace pension, it's, um, it's, a, it's a DC pension used by many different employers. 9% of their assets are 
private markets investments, and two thirds of them are private credit. Uh, two thirds of that is private credit. So it's about 6% private credit, 3% um, other investments. Um, just uh, 10 days ago, they announced they are increasing their private asset investment to 15% by expanding the investment in infrastructure. Um, and they're also careful to point out that because of the way they're growing and their liquidity profile, they think that they could easily cope with a move up to 20% at some time in the future. So there's an example of a DC pension plan uh, that is increasing its um, exposure to, to infrastructure, other private assets, but, but also very wary of uh, uh, that there is a liquidity limit at some point, even if they are growing very quickly. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I think it's very interesting for, for those of us in Greece to, to actually get a grasp on uh, the exposure that's around, um, you know, in line with what was uh, discussed earlier in the previous session, um, from nine to, to under 30%, as you said, as you assess on, on, on such assets. Fivos, uh, what's your opinion on, on this issue? Uh, well, I would agree with Guy that um, our real alternative assets like commodities, metal, real estate, they do offer substantially inflationary protection. I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, the diversification portfolio effect of those alternative assets, especially for private equity investments. Uh, after hearing Elise Gourier today, uh, but I would say as, as a matter, um, as a practical matter, uh, those investments actually depend on two things, on the interest rate structure, if you think about this, and two, of the credit availability. Uh, those two critical parameters for these investments are the same risk hurdles with other asset classes that are publicly traded. Again, Artemis, skeptical about how much alternative are those assets? Okay, well, that's that's an interesting uh, question. I think it could it could take up a, a whole session uh, uh, by itself. So, so I'll quickly, you Set know, uh, in consideration of time, I'll jump to the next question. So we, uh, you know, at the end of the previous session, we heard a very nice presentation by um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ewan Murray on ESG and asset management, which is the new trend. It's a big hype. So I'd like to ask: Is it a hype, or do you think that there's something more substantial here? Um, uh, Guy, what, what you, you mentioned um, uh, ESG, I think earlier. So what do you do in USS with regard to ESG? Um, so at USS, we have had an, e, uh, an ESG team. We call it a responsible investment team uh, since 2000. Um, and uh, we were very much along with uh, Hermes, a, a a sort of a pioneer in this, although we started a little later than they did. Um, we, we work with other pension funds and with asset managers, um, both sides, uh, asset owners, asset managers globally on this. Um, we've been involved in the UN uh, PRI, uh, like Hermes. Um, we uh, helped to set up the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change in 2001. And we're a signatory to, you know, Montreal Pledge, uh, the Transition Pathway Initiative, etc. cetera. Um, we do carbon footprinting of our assets. Um, we look at energy usage of our uh, real estate portfolio. Um, we were a founding member in the, um, uh, founding investor in the Global Real Estate Sustainability uh, Benchmark. Um, one of our private investments is Heathrow Airport. Um, uh, Heathrow Airport is, uh, and we've been uh, helping them and encouraging them to move in this direction, is net zero as, a, as an organisation. But clearly the planes that operate out of there are not net zero, but uh, there is a hope we'll, we'll get there. Um, and what, another of our investments, Thames Water, is a, uh, is a, is a net zero, mm. uh, or at least has a net zero commitment um, going forward. We as a scheme are committed to be net zero by 2050. We, th we think uh, if we look at all our investments in totality, it will take that long to get to that point, uh, given our size. 
but we focus on on three areas. One is um, integration, um, including ESG considerations in investment decision making, um, engagement, voting, and stewardship. So using our influence as owners of of equity, along and and partnering with other investors to promote good practice. And then uh, thirdly, market transformation activities. So uh, engaging, talking with policymakers, lawmakers, regulators uh, to try and articulate the concerns of asset owners and long-term investors uh, and try and find a, a set of policy um, uh, pathways or a journey through to, uh, uh, to make these things happen on a realistic timescale and, and realistically recognising the constraints of, of how fast uh, companies can move. So, so they're really the main three focuses we do. Great. Um, okay, well, um, wrapping up the whole asset allocation and investment strategies, um, a lot has been discussed on risk management and how risk management should be uh, ad uh, adapted to these new trends, whether that be. So I'll start with um, uh, what we, we discussed earlier, um, you know, um, uh, pension funds having to increase their risk profile in the search for yield, either through in, uh, increasing their um, uh, fixed income uh, risk or equity exposures. So how is this addressed from a risk management perspective? Guy, would you like us to uh, give us your, um, your practical experience from USS? Sure. Um, so look, it, 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 it's got, it covers many of the points that I discussed earlier when talking about the, the uh, hedging and matching assets. It's, it's really the other side of that. Um, it's, it's about looking at the overall risk profile uh, on an asset liability basis, um, seeing how much, how close we are to our risk limit, our risk budget. And, um, uh, and then it's a matter of if, if we are somewhat away from our risk budget, we can take a bit more risk. If we're at our risk budget, then we might think about re -pro restructuring the profile of risks we take by, for example, hedging out more of our liability risk to free up more, more risk capital for equities or for private assets or for credit risk. Um, and so we really do look at it on a total portfolio basis. The investment committee, and indeed the board, gives discretion to the investment manager, uh, to the subsidiary mm -hmm. that manages the investments, uh, to operate within broad risk parameters without uh, asset um, uh, allocation constraints or asset class constraints of that mm -hmm. kind. So the, the investment um, team really has uh, quite a bit of discretion within the limits of those risk parameters to choose how its risk budget is being spent amongst the different assets and indeed uh, amongst the liabilities as well. Great. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind the audience that um, please feel free to ask any question, write them down on the uh, box that you'll see on the right of your screen. And uh, we'll make sure to um, save some time at the end to address uh, questions from the audience as well. Um, so uh, Guy, following up on the, on, on the previous question. All right, so obviously, uh, you know, depending on the risk, um, tolerance that uh, a pension fund might have, you could enter several asset classes, either alternative or higher equity, whatever. So um, as discussed both by Dimitri Zafidis yesterday, who said that the use of derivatives to hedge interest and currency risk is substantial in a few member states. And uh, Nick Baltas earlier today, you know, uh, gave us a very nice introduction into systematic investing and how hedging can have three different, um, can, can be through three different, let's say frameworks. So my question is, um, from your experience at USS, do you apply hedging strategies such as portfolio insurance, uh, option hedging strategies? Do you use alternative schemes uh, to hedge the risk? Um, so we, we, we do hedging in a number of different ways. So direct hedges, uh, hedges with proxies, um, uh, there are correlation hedges. Um, but um, I, I think probably the most interesting uh, hedge program we, for, for us to talk about now that we use is, is really a tail risk hedging strategies, um, which are very specific to hedge against extreme market moves, such as the global financial crisis or last March's COVID crash. 
Um, where we're interested in hedging against moves that are greater than three standard deviations. And, and you know, using similar kinds of analytical approaches that, that Nick uh, Baltas spoke about uh, earlier today. And the idea is to give up a little bit of return each year to purchase uh, protection against a meltdown in the market. Um, you can't do this with options-based strategies, really, because they're just too expensive. So the focus is on looking at the aggregate balance sheet of the pension plan, looking at the, those risk factors and determining what's the cheapest way to protect uh, the, against uh, key risk factors moving against you. So it's very much a bespoke strategy. It's not an off the shelf product that uh, you, know, you, can, you can go and get from a number of providers. Uh, it needs to be designed and tailored uh, to the scheme. Um, and, and to be cost effective, clearly it, it's relying on correlations, it's relying on common risk factors across the balance sheet to make it work. Um, other, other sort of mechanisms we use are, are sort of volatility uh, management strategies and beta management strategies. Um, so it, it's really a combination of different things depending on you know, exactly what part of the risk we're trying to protect against. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so one quick last technical question on risk management. In your opinion, what are the most important risk me measures that pension funds should focus on today? Um, would you like me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Alfivos, please feel free to jump in if you if you would like to provide your insight. Well, Guy, yes, please. Um, so I think if you think about it, um, a pension a pension plan meets its liabilities by a combination of contributions and investment returns. So um, as long as the contributions are safe, so you've got a strong sponsor, uh, you really just need to worry about investment returns. And so looking at the asset liability risk associated with, uh, with your investments and your liabilities is, is the right way to do it. And looking at it through a number of different lenses downside risk measures, you know, for example, value at risk or um, conditional value at risk, scenario drawdown impact. Um, these are measures to look at. I, I think you need to look at more than one. I, I don't think there's one, one metric that really gives you the full, uh, the full picture. Um, you also need to look at uh, measures of illiquidity risk that you won't get uh, from such a, a, a simple um, you know, market volatility or market uh, return distribution approach. Um, and you also need to look at stress tests uh, to, to avoid getting caught up with model risk. And, you know, all these, all these sort of analytical approaches have model risk, but look at a simple stress test. Uh, you mm -hmm. cut through the model risk and you can, you can decide very quickly whether uh, you're capable of, uh, of stomaching that risk or whether that's a, a threat to you. Mm -hmm. If you have a weak sponsor, then uh, it may well be the credit risk of the sponsor to pay future contributions that's, um, uh, that's your biggest risk. And, and, and you may as well be, uh, be looking perhaps at the, um, at the credit rating and the, uh, or the credit, uh, the credit spread of your particular sponsor. Um, so I think, I think those, are, those are the most important risks, certainly from a defined benefit pension perspective. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, I think, you know, touching upon um, uh, risk management and uh, I guess the in increased uh, importance that has to be given uh, to that, I think I'll, I'll switch to, um, you know, regulation and then we'll close with the design of occupational pension schemes. So uh, you mentioned er um, uh, stress testing and we've heard that earlier in the sessions as well. Um, so do you think that um, uh, from the regulatory uh, point of view, do you think there's a need for more stress testing and back testing of the models used? Look, absolutely. I think um, all pension plans should, first of all, have a model risk management policy for all their models. Um, and all models that are used for decision making uh, or informing opinion, uh, anything that leads to uh, has an impact on your investment strategy, needs to conform to a model risk policy. So that means valuation models, it means risk models, it means ALM models, investment decision models of any kind, actuarial models. Um, and what that means is, you know, at one level, before you even start to, to code, you know, is the methodology the model uses appropriate? Secondly, testing that it's been coded correctly 
validating the inputs and then checking the outputs by, uh, by back testing to the extent you can. Um, but better than just back testing that they perform as expected, uh, run it in parallel with whatever you're doing now before it goes live uh, so that you can see if there are any glitches that you haven't uh, anticipated. And then, um, then test, you know, how would it perform in an extreme event? Uh, does it give you uh, what's expected? It's too late if you have an extreme event and you suddenly find out the model doesn't help you in that situation. Better to know that up front. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, given uh, the, the wide area of uh, investment um, options that we have now and the new trends uh, from, you know, to, to private equity, to alternative assets and everything, do you think that um, regulators should give a greater, should provide a greater flexibility to pension schemes to um, choose their investment strategies and assets? I mean, uh, what's your experience in the UK as to how much regulators actually impose on the uh, asset allocation side? Um, so I think um, reg regulators don't impose in the UK. A regulator doesn't, the regulator doesn't impose uh, constraints on investment strategy and, and neither I, I think should they. Um, I think it's important that pension plans have the flexibility to adapt the investment uh, and risk management strategies to suit their situation. Um, the appropriate asset allocation for a closed scheme is different from an open scheme, from a scheme that's growing, very different uh, from a scheme that isn't growing. Um, and all the other characteristics, uh, depending on the size of contributions that are coming in, uh, the nature of the membership, uh, all these things could lead to what is a different optimal asset allocation. So I, I think it's much better for regulators to set a general framework that controls risk and ensures there's good governance, but still enables the individual pension plan to develop a customized strategy. And then the regulator can understand, okay, that customized strategy makes sense for that pension plan because within the framework we've set, it looks like this. And, and that enables them to do it in a much less prescriptive way, but still in a very controlled way that, that I think uh, um, that I think is better for the overall financial system. If, if you dictate and, and prescribe uh, what these strategies and what the risk management approach is too much, not only are you going to get suboptimal outcomes for individual pension plans, but you also are going to get greater systemic risk if something goes wrong, because everybody will be doing the same thing. Great. Okay, so um, let's turn now to the design of occupational pension schemes. Um, Guy, could you provide us with your insight on the evidence of UK on the performance of the UK occupational pension schemes? I mean, I know that there's al already been a transition from defined benefit to defined contribution. H how has that worked in, in terms of home bias, tax incentives, you know, anything you, you could provide us? Uh, sure. Um... So um, most recent data I've got is the end of 2019. There were um, 22 million members of occupational uh, defined contribution schemes. Um, there were 18 million members of uh, defined benefit occupational schemes. So the majority of members are now in defined contribution and that's been a trend that has been happening for, uh, qu for quite some time. Um, and uh, to, you know the contributions into into DC pension schemes is rising rapidly. Um, as of um, so, it rose in 2018. It was something of the order of six billion in total. In 2019, it was already 14 billion. So huge growth, more than doubled in in that year. Um, however, they're starting from a lower base. So the the sort of the the gross assets excluding derivatives of uh, of occupational pension schemes about. 2.4 trillion pounds, um, of which uh, the, the defined benefit portion is about 2 trillion. Um, so it's about, you know, four times greater, or five times greater than, uh, than the DC bit. Um, however, if, if you look at the, the contributions that are coming in, two thirds of, of all of employees' contributions are going into DC. 
so it's go it's rising so quickly that it, it is soon you know going to going to overtake uh, going to overtake db um both forms get uh, get tax adva advantage saving and it's not they're not tax free it's just tax deferred you uh you pay in on pre-tax income it grow it rolls up and you earn returns on a tax-free basis and you pay tax at the end when you um when you draw down your pension so so there's a tax deferral uh, which is clearly in the interest of um, of the members and clearly is an encouragement to pension saving um i think the other question uh, you you raised was um in relation to home bias um i think there is still a home bias uh, amongst uk uh, schemes um uh it's in the uk on average, I think the average scheme has about um, six times greater exposure to UK equities than would be uh, than would be required on a market capitalization basis. Um, but that takes you to about thirty six percent UK, so it's you know a little over a third uh, of UK equities. But but it varies enormously. Um, at USS, we we have a UK bias, but it's very much less than that. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, um, uh, I'm sure as Phoebus will, will agree, the you know home bias is, is something that uh, you know for in terms of equities is something that is is generally not desirable, um, whereas it, it is is it is more desirable from a from a fixed income point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other point you mentioned was uh, in terms of returns. Well I think no, no. I think that's. I think we should, uh, you know, wrap up this question now because, in interest of time, or you know, it's been a very interesting discussion. So I'm sure, um, Guy, was what is your experience for um, around the issue of economies of scale and on contributions as well, the size of contributions? Sure. Um, I, I think, uh, Artemis, it's more than just economies of scale. Um, I think um, there are also advantages of opportunity. You you get to see. Uh, or get access to more funds and to private investors if you're bigger. Uh, there are advantage, advantages in terms of expertise. You can build uh, bigger, talented in-house investment teams, the bigger you are, um, and you can af afford to pay for, for more advice. Um, and there are also advantages in terms of governance. You can, you can set up the right governance if, because the costs are, um, uh, are smaller in a percentage basis. Um, uh, look, at, look in terms of in terms of contributions. Um, I view this as uh, as a budgeting exercise. It's about setting a budget. How much do you want to put in, given how much risk you're prepared to take uh, on an on an investment basis to pay the liabilities or to generate the size of pension pot you want at retirement. Um, it needs to be a prudent budget, but I think it's a budget. So. I don't think you can give a generic answer. You need to see what the um, what the ultimate uh, retirement uh, provision objective is for, for each scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one last quick question. Um, uh, what level of management fees can be considered reasonable and uh, how are performance fees perceived uh, within the talk, a context of designing, you know, the setup of the investment framework? Um, Guy, I'll start with you, and Fivo said I'd also like to hear your view on that later on. Sure. Um, look, um, I think I think in the UK certainly and, and globally, pension funds are putting pressure, downward pressure on on fees. Um, but asset manager profit margins are still pretty high. Um, you know, about two and a half times the average uh, corporate profit margin. Um, there is improving visibility on fees. You know, the UK has a cost transparency initiative uh, that was kicked off in 2018 uh, on this. Um, and, uh, and fees have been falling in certain asset classes as a result. But, you know, cheaper is not always better. Um, you've got to ask, what are you getting? Um, it is worth paying a bit more if you get better alignment with, with your objectives and, and, better, and better alignment of incentives uh, for performance fees is certainly worth paying for. I think performance fees are, can really only be justified if there is alignment with pension plan objectives and, and you minimise any conflicts. Um, 
yeah, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we're running out of time. So I have uh, one last question for each of you. Um, uh, I'll start with Guy. So um, in light of the forthcoming Greek reforms, um, I know that you heard that, um, you know, we ha yesterday um, during the conference, uh, during the opening of the conference, we had the minister, um, Mr. Panos Takloglu, speak about the transformation of the um, auxiliary pension scheme from um, defined benefit to com defined contribution. So what is the experience from NEST? NEST. So um, NEST, as I said earlier, is, the, is a government workplace uh, pension scheme. Um, and uh, lots of businesses opt to use NEST uh, to help their employees build a pension fund instead of setting up their own schemes because it's, it's cheaper, it's more convenient, and you do get the economies of scale we were, and, and, and other uh, advantages of scale we were talking about. Um, and self-employed people can use it as well. Um, but they don't have to. You could you could still opt to do something as a personal pension without without it. But um, one of the things that have, that has been very successful for 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 or very instrumental in Nest's uh, success is uh, automatic enrolment, uh, whereby it's compulsory for employers uh, to automatically enrol their employees into a pension scheme, and. Uh, and not only that, but the employer must also pay money into the scheme. And this was phased in over the period 2012 to 2018. So it's been going, you know, for about eight years now. Um, started with the biggest employers and then uh, moved on to, to smaller ones. The first contribution was £11 in 2011. Um, and... Uh, the, the total value of the fund as of September was 13 billion. So it's been a huge, uh, a huge increase. Um, I think Nest is widely regarded as, as a big success. You know, they, um, uh, they've got a very competent team. Uh, they invest, uh, as I mentioned, in, in private assets. Uh, they do have a, a relatively low investment risk outlook because their goal, you know, they have a they have a, a role in terms of um, uh, a social purpose to create a better retirement outcome for a large proportion of, of the UK workforce. So it's all about low charges. It's not for profit. It's open to everyone. Um, and it, it's about building scale so you can deliver that uh, cheaply. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, thank you, Guy. And uh, if you both want well, um, I think uh, this uh, wraps up the, uh, the discussion of the panel. Um, and I think we could go now to um, questions um, from the audience. Uh, may I remind everyone that you could um, uh, just type in your question um, uh, at the right of your screen. Um, so uh, I don't see any question coming up right now. I don't know if George Skadopoulos can let us know if that's correct or if I'm just not seeing any questions. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I have sent you on, Artemis. I don't know if you can see it. Um, hold on a second. Unfortunately not. I still see the questions of the previous session. Okay. Let me read it out for you then. It says, investors have been sold at no cost. Central bank put options through their firm commitment to market stability. Therefore, most investors' long-term hedging in recent years has been detrimental to returns. As valuations have soared, the need for investor protection is as important as ever, but so is the fear of basis risk and of the breaking down of traditional correlation patterns. How should investors plan and protect against such a change in market paradigm? It's a long question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, uh, Guy, do you think you could give us your view on that? On, on that? Um, I, it, it's a very good question. I think um, I think this is uh, certainly one of the scenarios that uh, that we've been running. I'm sure a lot of pension funds have been running uh, in terms of what uh, what you know how the world may be different going forward uh, as a result of um, 
as a, as a result of what we've seen from central banks uh, recently, um, uh, what this may do to correlations, uh, how, uh, how, how governments may uh, start to uh, rectify their debt position over time, what may happen to inflation, uh, et cetera. I think, um, I think these are very interesting scenarios that all pension funds need to be running to, uh, to make sure they're thinking hard about uh, what the response might be should these things happen. Um, and clearly it, it's about not getting yourself positioned in such a way that should these things happen, um, you're going to uh, be overly impacted by it. But clearly you can't, you can't remove uh, the impact entirely, but you, but you can uh, protect yourself on a relative basis by, by just anticipating what is most likely as a downside and, uh, and positioning appropriately. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, uh, so I think we, I see one. I see one new question uh, for Guy Coughlin. Uh, so the question is, do you see ESG considerations as a source of alpha, a source of beta, or more so about making an impact in the real economy via the three princi principles you mentioned today? Um, I think we can certainly make an impact in the real economy. Um, I think that that is a given. Uh, at the moment, I think it can be a source of alpha. Uh, it becomes a source of beta when it becomes more uh, incorporated in a more widespread way into, uh, uh, into the investment uh, industry. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think, I think for now there is, uh, there is alpha to be had um, by, uh, by being selective. Um, you can um, certainly, you know, what we've seen from Hermes was, um, uh, you know, the analysis that, that, that Ian presented was, was uh, you know, was very clear. At USS, we have a, a similar experience in terms of um, uh, being able to, to see alpha coming from certain, um, certain investments uh, with an ESG bent, um, but it isn't, it isn't given. Um, while ESG is integrated into the investment strategy that we take, um, we are still driven overwhelmingly by uh, the financial assessment. Does this investment make economic sense in a rational way? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I, I don't see any new question. So um, I'll, I'll leave it to George to interrupt me if uh, something new has come up and I, and I can't see it. Um, uh, Fibos, so, I'll ask you a question. Artemis, Excuse me? There, is, there is one. Okay. Do you see it now? If you refresh. Mm. Oh, yes, I did. I, I can see it right now. So um, the question says, thank you for a great discussion. Question for Guy. If you were launching today a new a defined contribution plan with very long liabilities, so young participants, no outflows for at least 15 years, what asset allocation would you tend to choose? Um, I think... Uh, I, th I think you need to be you need to be going for a high growth asset allocation, um, but I think it's also important that in the early years uh, the you minimise the risk of underperformance. Uh, one of the things we need to do is influence behaviour uh, and create incentives to save. Um, and um, uh, negative negative performance, significant negative performance in early years can can be detrimental to that. So I think. Um, you know, sacrificing a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of upside in the early years to to help you know ensure that performance is uh, or, or to help help increase the probability that performance is is uh, favourable in the early years is is helpful. But generally speaking, um, it, it it should be a high growth but well diversified uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Great. And uh, so I'll ask one last question to Guy as well. Um, so on the debate on the um, alternative, also um, a very hot topic of uh, private equity uh, or liquid assets, you mentioned that in the USS, it's a little under 30%. So my question would be, you know, obviously now you have a large asset base, so you can uh, diversify. If, 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 if uh, we're talking about a new small uh, defined contribution plan, do you think they should enter through, let's say, diversified funds? 
you know, we know that there are a lot of funds that package through a diversified portfolio exposure to private equity assets or real assets. Yes, look, I, I, th I think um, I think private assets are an excellent investment for defined contribution funds. Uh, there is a challenge when you're a small defined contribution fund, um, but um, but provided you know the the costs are not crippling for the size of the investment you you want to make, then uh, then that's uh, you know that is the the option you you can do. I mean, Nest, as I mentioned, has been invested in. Um, uh, in private in private assets for some time, uh, although you know they're relatively large now, but uh, but but they have grown quickly, so they haven't always been. Um, I think I think this is an important asset class to to supplement the more traditional asset classes that that uh, DC schemes have been invested in. Perfect. Uh, well, um, George, if I, I see no new questions, if not, I think we'll wrap up uh, the discussion and uh, we'll leave the closing remarks to you. Um, uh, Guy and Phoebos, thank you very much for a um, very interesting uh, discussion through this roundtable uh, panel. And uh, George, I'll leave it to you to, to do the final wrap up of the two-day uh, very interesting conference. Thank you very much, Artemis. Thank you, Fivos. Thank you, Guy. Uh, I think that was a very fascinating panel discussion. I mean, uh, you really touched on, uh, you know, upon so many issues on risk, return, design, management fees, risk measures. And I think the, the whole conference reflects the philosophy of the Institute of Finance and Financial Regulation, that is to create knowledge to learn something new out of this. As I said yesterday, we're not just an event organizer, we're a think tank where business converges with academia. So if I may wrap up at this point, you know, whenever we go away from a conference, it's always good to keep in mind some highlights. And at least to me, it seems that the highlights from yesterday's session were, you know, Theodore's economic talk on, uh, on what it takes to continue being successful. Uh, I think the gist is that, you know, new techniques need to be uh, employed. For instance, Theodore mentioned the growth of artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data. Then um, David McCarthy talked about the regulation. He was spot on and he mentioned that you know, everything has to be done in the interest of the pensioner. That must be the objective function, if you like. And then Dimitri Zafiris mentioned a really interesting finding from the AOPAS back testing and stress testing results that, you know, there are substantial risks out there, which if they materialize, they may lead to a 2% uh, loss in GDP at a pan-European level. And then today we had a very interesting uh, session on uh, strategies, asset classes, alternative investments. So Nick Baltas uh, walked us through how to construct strategies to uh, protect ourselves against uh, downside risks. Elise Gourier brought up a very interesting finding that the correlations between private equity and standard asset classes are not that low as we believe they are. And a notable exception is the case of venture capital. And finally, Join Mary talked about the growing importance of ESG. He spotted a number of things. We could have, you know, a special event on ESG. And actually, that's one of, of our plans in the future. Uh, you know, things like, for instance, how data across vendors differ and the challenges uh, that this may uh, cause. And eventually we had this fantastic panel. So I would like to thank all our speakers. I would like to thank you, Artemis, for the excellent moderation. I would like to thank our chairs, Michael Anthropelos yesterday and Giga Sarduvelis today. I would also like to thank the IFFR staff and especially Desvina Kondopoulou, who did a fantastic work. I don't think that this conference would be possible to be done without her help. I would also like to thank 
the, the team of Eventora, the IT team, uh, we had to, you know, to, to bring a, a big burden on them on how to operationalize things. I would also like uh, to thank my colleagues. And uh, last, but of course not least, I would like to thank our valuable uh, sponsors, the gold sponsor, Iolcus Investments, the sponsors, uh, Systemic and Piraeus Asset Management and uh, Alpha Trust, our supporter, for their faith in our initiatives and uh, for their uh, support. And of course, I would like to thank the audience uh, which devoted, you know, two days uh, from their lives. But I hope that that was uh, rewarding. We all knew, learned uh, new things. I invite you all to, you know, to continue visiting uh, our site, the IFFR site, to find out about our news and activities, our news on new research outputs, our news on uh, new events, and on our uh, other activities on consulting and training. And feel free to get in touch with us for any ideas you may have on collaboration. We are very much an open platform and we grow uh, as you know, we collaborate uh, with you. So you may have noticed we are not the typical academic institution, we're very much open. You can tell this even by visiting our uh, website. And I should also say at this point that uh, Hartis company has done a great job in designing these uh, sites. So many thanks to Hartis. And with this, I would like to conclude. Uh, I wish you uh, a very nice day uh, to Europe and to US and a very nice evening to Asia. Thank you very much. And um, we'll come back to you with any further advances and news. Bye-bye.